Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning on this wonderful weekend and enjoy uh, today's weather because it's the heat's coming back. It should be a nice, wonderful about 101 for game time Friday night without a bell broken bow. So, uh, I have my reserve seats. Yeah, my reserve seats, they're in the booth. And so it'll be a few degrees cooler than where I am, but that's okay. Uh, and, and so it's good to see everyone here this morning. I just I don't have very many announcements to go over. Uh, let me just kind of go through what I do have. Um, Steve was letting me know, for those of you who may be interested and, 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 and want to know, there are there's boxes of free COVID tests back there if you want one. They're yours for the taking, okay? Take one if you want it. Uh, and so Steve wants to make sure that everybody knew that because uh, it, it's the, they say it's coming back. And so just, hey, wash your hands. Just, that's, that's about all we can do is, is just do that. Um, so on the prayer list, let's, uh, we need to continue Destiny and Jonathan and Grayson and Jillian. Uh, latest report is Jillian is now about seven and a half pounds. She's a little chunk. Grayson is about six and a half pounds. And Grayson's kind of holding up this whole thing uh, with his respiratory issues. And so, uh, But they need to, I was telling others, they need to stay for three more weeks. Because that gives me a chance to have uh, the house taken care of and have the new roof and windows put in. And so they can actually move into their nursery, which is completed except for the window that was taken out by the tornado. So hopefully that happens in the next three weeks. And then, they, then they'll be home. And, and, and so we're all looking forward to that. That's where Rachel is today, by the way. It was her weekend to go see the grandkids. We keep uh, Gordon uh, Norwood in our prayers. The doctors are thinking about uh, an acute therapy center for him. We need to keep David Archer in our prayers. Charlie Fogg and the Fogg family. Uh, we need to keep the, uh, Jesse and Katie and, and Jack especially uh, in our prayers and in for Sammy. Uh, Sammy's going in and having a, a, a whole new, new new wheel put in, I guess, on the 17th. Yeah, having a knee replacement. All right, so let's keep Sammy in our prayers. Are there any others that we need to remember uh, before we continue our service? Yes, sir. Okay, so Avery's uh, grandpa, John White, uh, with Parkinson's, remember him in your prayers. Are there any others? If not, let's have a prayer before we continue. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you could give us. Father, what a wonderful time it is to be able to gather together here in our living room as family. As we sing your praises, Father, as we open your word, I pray that everything we do this morning, Father, will be offered up as a very sweet and savory sacrifice to you. I pray, Father, as we go through our songs, that you be with Don as he as he continues to, to direct our singing. I pray, Father, that you'd be with Rodney as he brings us message from your word. And once again, Father, may his words be your words. Father, we mentioned a few, we mentioned several on our prayer uh, list this morning. You know those needs. You know, Father, more than anyone what they need. So I pray for comfort, for healing, for peace, and for strength. I pray, Father, that as we go through this day, once again, our minds will be centered on you and not what's going on in our world. Forgive us, Father, when we stumble. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
or a couple more, I think the church, the church, why bother? So I chose this song. I may be the only one that really knows it. And the second verse of it, I don't, I'm going to have to turn around and look at the words because I don't sing the second verse very much. But when I was in college, I was in, a, I was in a group and we traveled and we sang this song. And everywhere we went, we, we sang about God's wonderful people, which is the church. It's the family. And as Jerry mentioned a while ago, in our living room together, it's great to see God's wonderful people. So, we sung this one other time here. I just uh, let's let's try it. I want us to learn it and hopefully not only get to it, but get the message out. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people.
centered around the cross. We have time in our service for observing the Lord's Supper. And this morning as I was thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made, I thought back to the sacrificial system. And we know that once a year, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. And he couldn't enter without cleansing of blood. 
So he not only cleansed himself, but he went in and cleansed the altar so that the Lord, when he came down to rest on the altar, it would be cleansed. The shedding of that blood was year after year. Sins were never forgiven. They would just roll forward to the next year. Just a reminder, next year, you got the same old, same old. Still got the sin. But when Jesus came, the sacrifice that he made once for all forgave us our sins. We don't need to take a lot of this time. We've got the bread over here that's going to represent the body. And we know that if you look in, at all the accounts of what went on in that uh, time before Christ died on the cross and everything that had to be done to that body before, before it was part of that sacrifice. And Jesus took that punishment, that crucifixion in our stead. We deserved it. And without his blood, we still would deserve it. But this morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're going to remember that we have salvation only because Jesus was willing to go to the cross. So as we get ready to partake of the bread, let us, let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we give you thanks for the sacrifice of your one and only Son. I have been there, Lord, and I know how that feels. And it's just not something that everybody wants to have to go through. But you gave your only Son, your only begotten Son, that we might have forgiveness of our sins. All we have to do is just partake of that, accept that, and you're willing to give us forgiveness. So this morning, Father, as we partake of this bread, we're going to remember the body of Jesus, the human part of Jesus, the part that suffered just as we suffer. And I can't imagine being nailed to a cross. Sweat drops like blood in the garden poured forth as Jesus contemplated what he knew would be his ultimate demise. But on the third day, to rise. So Father, this morning as we partake the bread, let us take our mind back to that time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Now as we get ready to partake of the fruit of the vine to us, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, when he shed his blood, it was life. Even though he died. If you go into any emergency room in the United States and you say, what is life? And they'll say, life-giving blood, that's the life. Somebody comes in here bleeding, they're bleeding out life. When we give them an IV and give them a blood transfusion, that's life. Jesus gave us life through his blood, and it's new every morning. How wonderful the sacrifice he gave us in the shedding of his blood. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful this morning to be able to partake of the fruit of the vine that to us represents the blood that Jesus shed for us on a criminal's cross thankful father that he was willing to go there and to suffer that loss he could have called 10,000 angels to take him down off that cross but he chose not to he chose to take that punishment the sting of death thank God for the third day because we know that that tomb opened up and he arose again and we're thankful for that resurrection father let us think about these things this morning as we partake of this juice in Jesus holy name amen Separate apart from the Lord's Supper this morning, we are thinking about our contribution and our giving. Uh, has any of you ever been to the treasurer? Sometimes it's a pretty tough job. I was treasurer back in the day. And we were 
had an asphalt parking lot out here that was falling apart. Ladies couldn't wear high heel shoes because they'd have the heels broke off before they got to the door. And this is true. And so we undertook building a concrete parking lot. And man, it was a struggle. It was going to cost a lot of money to pour that much concrete. But you know, a wise old elder stood up in the elders' meeting and said, you know that the cattle of the many hills belong to the Lord. And lo and behold, we built a parking lot. And that thing, you could land a 747 on that parking lot. I bet you in places it's a foot thick. But it was muddy and it was terrible when we started building it. But by the time it was through, it was beautiful. And you don't have to worry about breaking your heels off later. <laughs> Skate right on across there. Yeah. So this morning as we uh, take this time to remember what we need to do there about giving, uh, let us pray together. Father, we're grateful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us each day, the very clothes we wear, the very air we breathe. We know that all that we have belongs to you. And so this morning as we return a portion of what you've given us back. We pray that we do that with a with a joyful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Sing that often. 
In fact, one or two of the other songs we sang this morning, and some that were on my list that Tammy said, no, we shouldn't sing those, <laughs> are also ones that Jay led on. <laughs> it's not because they're not good songs. Jay loves to sing songs that are about praise and worship. In fact, he'll leave those almost exclusively. Uh, this is a song that we don't sing very often, but it really goes along with uh, the message, I think, that we're going to get today. So we're going to sing all three verses. It's a little bit long. I want us to stand. Don't stand yet. But the, uh, I, want you to, I want you to get a little bit of the feel of the song because you're going to go through, if you listen to the words, there's a lot of emotion in this. Uh, the apostles, I'm thinking of the time when Jesus was out on the sea with the apostles, and he's asleep in the bow of the boat, and during the huge storm, <coughs> this may not be what this, the writer of this song was thinking about, but it certainly fits. And uh, Jesus says to the storm, peace, be still. And the, the apostles respond, who is this? that even the winds and the waves obey them. So, let's stand. Now, we'll stand. And we'll sing a song, and then uh, Rodney will give us a message. <laughs> Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness, no shelter or hell. Please. 
Hawkins was a longtime pastor at uh, Luke Fada Baptist. Uh, his wife, his widow, uh, Doris, passed away this morning. So keep the Hawkins family uh, in your prayers. So the picture up there is from Nepal. Uh, that is the little tiny country north of India uh, in the Himalayas. Well, a few years ago, we happened to be in, in Moss Bluff, Louisiana, where uh, the congregation where Julie's parents uh, attend, and a good friend of ours had been on a mission trip to Nepal, and he was reporting about that experience, and it was, it was really interesting. It was different than anything I had ever heard about. What they were doing there is, is they were they were staying in the city, but then they would uh, on various days, they would hike up into the, the mountains. I'm sure it was uphill all the way, and then they would leave Bibles, and they would encourage the, the churches there in Nepal, and apparently they are primarily underground churches. Uh, and so... He was describing, though, and this is what I really want to share with you this morning, that they attended at least one worship service at night in one of these little villages in Nepal. And it was not a worship service like I imagine any of us have ever experienced before. It was completely dark. So they went into this little building by ones and twos at night. And it was obvious, and you could tell that there was a crowd, but there were no lights lit. And they sang, they prayed, uh, there was a message, and then they dismissed by, by ones and twos. Now, the reason why they kept the lights off is because they didn't want anybody telling on them, because they could get in big trouble for meeting together as Christians. And so if the lights stay off, nobody can positively identify somebody that's there. Uh, I can't imagine having to do church that way. Can you uh, it just, that's so foreign to uh, just my concept and my, my experience. Julie showed a, uh, shared a video on, on YouTube, or on YouTube, on Facebook. We've got it on YouTube this morning, Chance, if we could get there, that I want to share with you. Some of you, many of you have seen this, but it, it just challenges me every time I listen to this message. And so uh, go ahead and play that, Chance. Let me finish with this uh, story. Uh, we go to China from time to time, and... and uh, uh, we train leaders, and this time we brought up 22 leaders from the Hunan province, and they rode 13 hours on a train to get to a hotel that they came up two by two in these elevators as, so as to not draw any attention. And then they got to a hotel room, a little apartment uh, room. It's only about 700 square feet in the little living room, no air conditioning, hardwood floor, 22 sat there. I came in, and when you teach in China, you start at 8 in the morning, and you don't get done till 5 at night. You teach the whole day. They were sitting there, all 22 of them, and I looked around, and I said, now, if we get caught, what will happen to me? They said, oh, you'll get deported in 24 hours, and we'll go to prison for three years. I said, you're kidding. How many of you have been in prison for your faith? Out of 22, 18 raised their hands. I said, no. Way. 
I looked at him and I said, you, you 22 people, how many people do you oversee? Because they were all of these small group leaders, underground church leaders in the Hunan province. I said, how many, if you counted all the people under your jurisdiction, how many would it be? And they counted them up and they said, a little over 20 million. And I said, hmm, what? See, we forget there's 1.3 billion people in China. This is crazy. Well, I had 15 Bibles and I passed them out. Obviously, seven didn't get them. And I said, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to read it. And just then, one lady handed hers to somebody next to her. And I thought, hmm, interesting. Well, we turned there anyway. And as we started reading it, I understood why she gave it away. She had memorized the whole thing. She just recited the whole chapter. When it was done, I went over to her at a break and I said, you, you, you recited the whole chapter. She says, oh yes, I've memorized many chapters. I said, where did you memorize many chapters? She said, in prison. She said, you have much time in prison. So I said, but don't they confiscate the Bible? And she said, yes. So people bring in scriptures written on pieces of paper and they bring it in. So I said, but then if they find that piece of paper on you, won't they confiscate that? She said, oh yes, that's why you memorize it as fast as you can. Because <laughs> even though they can take the paper away, they can't take what's hidden in your heart. Wow. Well, after three days, you fall in love with these people. And when it was done, I said, how can I pray for you? I'm going to go back to America. You guys have been just so wonderful. How can I pray for you? They said, you know, Wayne, you guys can gather like this whenever you want to in America. We can't. Could you pray that one day we'll be just like you? And I looked at him and I said, I will not do that. Big incredulous eyes looked at me and they said, why? <laughs> I said, because you guys rode a train for 13 hours to get here. In my country, if you've got to drive more than an hour, people don't come. You sat on a wooden floor for three days. In my country, if people have to sit more than 40 minutes, they leave. You sat not only here for three days on a hard wooden floor, but you did it without air conditioning. In my country, if it's not padded pews and air conditioning, people don't often come back. In my country, we have an average of two Bibles per family. We don't read any of them. You hardly have any Bibles, and you memorize them from pieces of paper. I will not pray that we become like, uh, you become like us, but I will pray that we become just like you. Well, that'll preach, won't it? We've been going through this, this series called Church... Why I bother? And, and I was was thinking about. I wonder how they would answer that question. If if we could could talk to some of those uh, Christians from either China or or Nepal, I wonder what they would say if we could say, okay, why do you, why do you bother with church? And I don't know that they would understand the question. But I think it would be something along the lines, their answer would be, we can't live without this. We literally can't live without church. Um, I don't know, but I, I suspect that that's the case. I'm always so challenged, convicted, whenever I hear about people Worshiping like they do in Nepal, and, and I, I've, I've seen that, that video. It's been a, a little while before Julie had shared it again recently, but it always is convicting to me. Hey, I'm the first to thank God for the air conditioning and the fairly comfortable seats in which we get to sit, and uh, I'm thankful that we are comfortable, and yet at the same time, I recognize that sometimes our comfort kills us spiritually. And that's just the reality. I wonder how they would answer. 
I wonder how we would be, as, as far as church goes, would we continue to be church if we were in that situation? As we continue this series, today's answer of church, why I bother, is we need each other for the coming persecution. And, and yes, I do believe that persecution is coming even here to us. I don't believe that we are always going to be as comfortable and, and for it to be as easy as it is right now. And I'll, I'll share over the next few minutes. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach for eight hours like we were in China, okay? But for the, the next few minutes, I want to hopefully convince you that we are coming down, and I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think coming down the road, we're going to be faced with increasing persecution in this country for our faith. So, Let's look at some scripture here. Ecclesiastes 4. I love Ecclesiastes and I love this passage. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And by the way, think about that in terms of spiritual fire. How do you keep on fire spiritually by yourself? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. The preacher is saying, hey, you're stronger when you're together. We're stronger when we're together. Paul says this in Galatians 6 to carry each other's burdens and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. A couple of things there. One is we can't carry each other's burdens if we're not close to each other. Now, listen, we can't be equally close to everyone in the congregation, but we need to have people that we're close to within this, this church family that we help carry their burdens. We can't do that if we're not if we're not tight. The other thing is, that's how we fulfill Christ's law is by helping each other. I didn't always hear that growing up. I, it seemed like I, I heard other things, but I didn't always hear that. I saw it a lot of times, and I didn't hear it. But we, we fulfill the law of Christ as we carry each other's burdens. Most of us agree that we need some help sometimes. Even the most self-sufficient of us will agree that there are times when we need help and we need Christian friends and we need brothers and sisters in Christ. But you may not be convinced that persecution is coming. And again, I hope I'm wrong about this. But the trends are pointing in that direction. And, and we've talked about this before. I, I'll just tell you, the Lord convicted me, uh, it's probably been two or three years ago, that a big part of my preaching and teaching needs to be preparing, especially the next generation, for what I believe is coming down the road. It, it's going to be tougher, I believe, for our kids and, and grandkids to be faithful to Christ in the the context in which we live than it has been for, for us for most of our lives. And listen, Christianity is not easy in any context. We, we know that. But when the those in positions of power are making it difficult, I, I love the song service this morning, Donnie. Uh, I, I believe the, the Lord was leading you in that, but that, that song, Master the Tempest is Raging. Uh, and, and we could talk about this in terms of the, the trials and difficulties that we go through, not just persecution. But when we're in the midst of the storm, we want Jesus to steal the storm and to do it quickly. But he doesn't 
always still the storm in our time. Now he knows what he's doing. We have to learn to trust. I, I want to share a little bit of evidence with you that I believe, why I believe that we are, are headed towards a time of, of greater persecution. And so I, I've mentioned this book before. It's Rod Dreher's book, Live Not By Lies. I encourage you to read it. Uh, he shares in, I believe it's chapter one, uh, some, some thoughts from uh, a, a author named Hannah Arendt. I think that's the way her name is pronounced. She wrote a book, late 40s, early 50s, called The Origins of Totalitarianism. And, and the reason I want to mention this is because, listen, if we're going to experience persecution, it's going to be because of totalitarianism. And, and I would suggest to you that we are probably already in this country in a soft totalitarianism, at least culturally. Uh, but but she shared conditions, and I, I believe there's, there's seven or eight that I, I want to share from her book, that she says these are the, the conditions that exist in societies where totalitarianism comes about. Okay, And remember, that's totalitarianism is where persecution happens. Okay, And so as we, we look at these now, she was looking back at Nazi Germany and she was looking at, at pre-Soviet Russia. And she was saying, hey, this is what society was like in those countries before totalitarianism happened. Before the Nazis took over, before the Soviets took over in Russia. First thing she said was loneliness and social isolation. People were isolated. Interestingly enough, in May of this year, the Surgeon General put out a warning on the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States of America. Saying, hey, we are a nation that is isolated and lonely to the point that it is at epidemic proportions and it is affecting our mental health and physical health and affecting us as a, as a society. So Hannah Arendt was looking back and she was saying, hey, the places where totalitarianism grows are in places where people are lonely and isolated. A society full of lonely, isolated people are prime targets for totalitarian ideologies. Second thing that she shared that these that leads to totalitarianism is losing faith in hierarchies and institutions. Now, now again, keep in mind she's writing about Nazi Ger or pre-Nazi Germany, pre-Soviet Russia. You probably don't need me to say this. But I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. It's uncanny how many of these are like the society that we are living in now. Uh, have you seen or heard anyone say, I don't know, something about how they don't trust government or the deep state or the medical system or the education system or the election system? Y'all heard anything like that in the last few years? Now, have you said anything like that in the last few years? Okay. Another thing that these societies have is the desire to transgress and destroy. There, there's almost this spirit that, that she was seeing in these pre-Nazi uh, Germany, pre-Soviet Russia, that there was just this, this desire to sin that was rampant in the society and to destroy Obviously, we have, we've not seen anything like that in our culture, right? Uh, nothing about, you know, destroying traditional values or transgressing. Uh, have you noticed that the, the family has been under attack really for a couple of generations now? Fourth, propaganda and the willingness to believe useful lies. I want to read you a quote here. This is from a lady, a, a 
hesitate to pronounce, try to pronounce her name, Hedda Kavali. And she was a disillusioned Czech uh, communist whose husband was executed in 1952 after a, a show trial. Anyway, she had these words to say. It's not hard for a totalitarian regime to keep people ignorant. Once you relinquish your freedom for the sake of understood necessity, for party discipline, for conformity with the regime, for the greatness and glory of the fatherland, or for any of the substitutes that are so convincingly offered, you see your claim to the truth. Slowly, drop by drop, your life begins to ooze away just as surely as if you had slashed your wrist. You voluntarily condemn yourself to helplessness. It, let me put this, what she's saying there in, in, in layman's terms. She's saying that once you submit to what some authority, whether it's government or social or cultural, has to say, and you end up compromising the truth. You're not living in the truth anymore, but it happens drip by drip by drip. Um, propaganda and the willingness to believe useful lies. Let me give you a modern Example, you may have heard of the 1619 Project. This is propaganda writ large. But basically what the 1619 Project says is and it, it's, a, it's a way of reinterpreting history, the history of our country. And the, the gist of it is, is that this country's foundations are not July 4th, 1776. Right, you, you've all heard that that's our birthday, right? And that there were these principles of freedom uh, and liberty that were that provided our uh, this foundation that we have these rights given by God. But what the 1619 Project says is that no, what this country is based on is when the first.